All right. So I have a very special guest today, everyone. I have Zelfi Taylor from Taylor Insurance and Financial Services. And he is a phenomenal uh, life insurance professional as well as a financial advisor in the Pasadena Tri-City area. So Glendale, Burbank, and pretty much all over LA. I wanna say greater LA. And we're um, also on live via Instagram. So if you see us looking in two different directions, it's because we're trying to put the most out there for everyone to get their info going. And so I really um, want to thank him for joining me today because I really wanted to um, make this expert insight series accessible to everyone in the public, right? And I want to bring out information and I want to put information out there that the general public should know, wants to know, and is hungry to know and get information. Because I think a lot of people are at home, but a lot of people are just very confused by what's out there and the information that's out there. And I think there's a lot of misinformation. So this series was designed to put information out, to put accurate information out. Um, I have personal access to a lot of professionals. So I consider myself lucky. I could just pick up the phone and call an employment attorney and say, hey, what do I do with this, this, and the other? But I think most generally, a lot of business owners and professional um, people out there don't really have that luxury. So I wanted to give my access to people to you guys. So this is, this is what the series is about. Um, and today we're going to be talking about COVID-19 and how it relates to life insurance and financial, uh, the financial world in general, whether that's retirement accounts or stock portfolios. So I have we posted that we were going to have you as a guest and we had a lot of questions come in and then we also had a lot of questions within our office that we thought were going to be important for information for people to know so we're going to just jump right in Zelfi, do you want to tell us anything else about yourself before we start uh no not really i mean i i you uh gave me an intro i've been a financial advisor for 20 years so um he doesn't look it. Yeah, I, 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 look, I, look, I look black, black don't crack. Remember that. Um, I've been a financial advisor 20 years. So, I mean, you, you name it, I feel like I've, I've seen it. I've been through it. And so just like you mentioned, um, you have a wealth of experience and a wealth of resources at your disposal. I do the same and, and same thing. I'm trying to just share those insights and experiences with my clients and people that I come across and, and uh, be a blessing to them. So. Yeah, so feel free. Go ahead. I I I, uh, I always like to um, have someone ask me a question that stumps me. So I'm yet to be stumped. So please. Uh oh. Me. <laughs> Challenge accepted. Let's do this. Okay. So we're hearing a lot of information from different professionals. I think we're getting a lot of posts out there. Get life insurance. It's the best time to get it. People are scared that something's going to happen and they're going to pass away. And we're seeing an uptick in the number of people that are interested in life insurance. So what is going on? How has COVID affected your industry? Yeah, I think Forbes magazine put an article out right at the onset, like mid-March, um, talking about um, the coronavirus pandemic spurring a huge uh, interest uh, in the purchase of life insurance. Interestingly enough, the carriers on a carrier level, they haven't really we haven't seen a lot of changes with underwriting as of yet. So I would actually tell people like, if you haven't gotten life insurance yet, or you want to ramp up your coverage, get it now because they haven't changed, right? They haven't changed the underwriting criteria. And, and one thing that I explained to people is that when you're predisposed to certain illnesses or, 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 or have certain health issues, it makes you either uninsurable altogether or your rates are going to be higher, right? And so for example, if you were predisposed to health heart disease, you couldn't get life insurance. If you were predisposed to cancer, you couldn't get life insurance. Yet we're all predisposed to COVID-19 and we can all get life insurance and not only get life insurance, still get it actually at the best rating class because they're not, they're not testing for that in the underwriting process. So I tell people, if you're thinking about life insurance, getting it, getting more, do it right now because the reality of it is all indications are such that underwriting will change mortality table, tables will change and the policies will become more expensive in the future. So you could wait and you can come to me in the future and pay more and get less, or you can start right now, right? So, so, and it's, and it's a bit of a morbid joke that I tell, but life insurance is the only form of insurance you buy that I guarantee you'll use, right? When you think about all the money you spend on car insurance, homeowners insurance, health insurance, you know, liability insurance programs you may or may not use, it kind of makes sense to buy the one form of insurance that you're guaranteed to use. It's, it's crazy. Even this morning, I was talking 
you know, with, with uh, my, my girl's mother and we're talking about, you know, I don't know why she was talking about me dying. But I was like, what do you think? What do you, are you plotting That's on a me normal dying? conversation an ex-wife no. has <laughs> from, from time exactly. to time. But, but, you know, she's always like, well, tell me what to do, map this out. And, and, and I'm like, okay, these are all the things. And, and I'm like, as much as I, as much as I don't want to die tomorrow, I was pretty pleased with myself. I'm like, I've done some pretty good stuff. I've got it all kind of, you know, you know, you know, mapped out. And at the end of the day, you basically have to, you know, come to this realization. Nobody's going to do it better than you. Nobody's going to do it better than mom. Nobody's going to do it better than dad. No one's going to be a better husband or wife than you, right? You, you got it locked down. But at the end of the day, not, not if, when you were removed from the equation, what happens? And a lot of times when you look at it, especially if you have a young family, like I've mentioned at the onset, I've got daughters, my oldest is 13, twins are 10. If something happened to me tomorrow, that'd be bad, right? Who's paying for school? Who's paying for the, the programs and activities and all the other things that I would have otherwise provided if I were here, right? And then this is where like the work you come in on the estate planning side. Mm -hmm. I, I create liquidity. Life insurance creates the money. Right. So if I'm not here, I can basically make sure that all the money I would have brought to my family in the next five, 10, 20 years, it's there. But then you have to manage that. Right. Do I want to leave millions of dollars unchecked to three 18 year old girls? No. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, no, not my girls. If you know my girls, you say no. Right. So 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 this is where the estate planning documents come into play. And this is where your work and my work come really in tandem right? Because you can create this ironclad legal document under the provisions by which distributions are to be made. But then the question begs, well, where's the money coming from, right? Now I can create the money, right? But a life insurance policy in and of itself doesn't manage how the money's spent, right? And so you really need to have this, this, you know, cohesive, the estate plan isn't done with a trust alone or life insurance alone. It's a part of a, a of a whole comprehensive, comprehensive, comprehensive plan. plan. Yeah. I totally agree with you. I think I think a lot of people think that one and the other are exclusive from each other and they're not intertwined. Right. And oftentimes, and you and I see this, we see life insurance being purchased, but the extra step that the parents need to take to go through the process of leaving it through a trust for their kids is not being done. Right. So what ends up happening is the, the amounts are there for the kids. They're in a guardianship account and they can't use it until they're 18 and then they get one lump distribution at 18 which is yes. definitely not no, the no, of no good i mean i've been 20 years i've been doing this right and I, I i really can't even tell you well generally speaking i i do not see favorable outcomes when i see that when 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 young and here's the crazy thing it's not only the 18 year old that gets the money that blows through it it's the 30 year old that does it it's the 50 year old that does it it's mm -hmm. the 6 year old that does it because generally speaking we're even people that make good money. Even if you go, no, he's so I'm used to money. I make good six figure income. It's a difference from getting a five or 10 or even 15,000 on a paycheck every two weeks to literally be being given 500,000 or a million dollars or $2 million at once. Right. And, and, and you have to be a good, you know, steward of that. Right. I think, you know, money obviously brings a lot of opportunity, but can, it can also bring a lot of chaos if not managed properly. And so I see that, you know, I see that firsthand. Right. So, um, my first thing is adequate life insurance. Do you have enough, right? That's number one. So people get into what's better a term, a whole life or universal, forget that. Do you have enough coverage first? That's number one. And I call that human capital. Human capital is quite simply the present value of your future earnings, right? So when you determine, well, how much life insurance do I even need? Take the amount of money it would take to replace your income on an annual basis to your family, whatever that is. Right? My family would need $100,000 a year if I wasn't around, okay? 100,000 times 20, that's $2 million. That's how much coverage you need, right? With the idea being a 5% payout rate on $2 million would generate $100,000 a year of income in perpetuity, thus replacing your income to your family. So whatever your family needs on an annual basis, if you were not here, take that number and multiply that number by 20. If you do not have that number of life insurance, you're underinsured. So that's not even to say that the policies or planning that you've done thus far is bad. It's just, do you have enough? Example, if you bought a home and your home was worth a million dollars, your home was worth a million dollars, right? Would you buy a homeowner's policy for $300,000 to protect its value? Well, no, right? Why? Because if your house burned down, $300,000 doesn't replace its value. And the same can be said, if I make $100,000 a year and I have $250,000 of life insurance, I'm like, oh, I'm good. I got life insurance. Well, 
what is my family going to do with two and a half years of my income? Two and a half years of my income, mm -hmm. right? So, so, so when my 13 year old turns 15 and my 10 year old twins turn 12 and the money runs out, then what? And that's something that people Crazy. don't oftentimes think about. I like to let shake. Me, let me ask you this. I know you talked about earning potential and replacing that earning potential through the use of life insurance, but what's your opinion? Because I feel very strongly about my opinion when it comes to life insurance for people who aren't bred, you know, they, they're not earning income for their family. So I'm talking about the, the mothers, the fathers that are stay at home parents. I feel like their value that they bring to the family is also monetary and that should also I, be protected. I, I, I write, I write no less than a million dollars minimum on a stay at home spouse husband, wife, at least a million. And here's why. Some people tell me, oh, come on, I don't need insurance for my wife. She stays home. She takes care of the kids, right? She doesn't even bring in income. There's no income. Tell me you life. break it down for them. Right? You break so, it down so, for them. So here's, so here's the breakdown. Okay. So she doesn't earn an income. Okay. But if you had to pay someone to get your kids up in the morning, get them ready for school, take them to school, pick them up, take them to, take them to t-ball practice, take them to gymnastics, take them to dance, right? Cook, clean, manage the household, all those things. They estimate the value of a stay-at-home spouse at over $50,000 a year because if you were paying someone to do all those things, and here's what people go, well, well I can do it. Okay, one or two things are going to happen. One or two things are going to happen, right? Either you're going to stay home and you'll do it, in which case your income will suffer, or you're going to have to pay someone to do it, right? Mm -hmm. Either way. And a lot of times if you go, well, I've got to work even harder now to bridge that gap of lost income or last lost capacity from my deceased spouse. And in that instance, your, ch your, children, your children didn't lose one parent, they lost two, right? They lost one to, to, to an untimely death and then lost the other to work, right? And so maybe I look at it this way, maybe I want enough life insurance on my spouse, even if she's not working, maybe there's enough life insurance that if she died, maybe I don't want to work. Maybe I don't want to work 60, 70 hours a week anymore. Maybe there's enough liquidity there now where I go, you know what, I'm still going to run, my, run, my, uh, run my, my company, but I'm not going to work 60 hours a week. I'm going to work 30 hours a week, and I'm going to work, and I'm going to take Fridays off, right, and be home with my girls. And I know that I have the income, right, offset, right, by this life insurance that I'm losing by not being in the office, right? And if, and if COVID-19 has taught us anything, myself included, Maybe we, maybe we, in general, we don't even have to work that much or we can mm -hmm. work more from home. I mean, you know, I, I, I was, I was saying in a, a podcast I did earlier today that last Friday I went out with a friend of mine riding bikes to get lunch Friday at 12 o'clock. And I would never on a Friday never. at 12 o'clock ever go ride and get, I, I would feel so guilty, right. For doing that. And, and it's, and it's, and I realized now like, wow, okay. I, I, I can do that. And guess what? Right. I don't, I don't think I lost any opportunity. Right. And guess what? The problems I had before I went on that bike ride were still there when I got back, right? So, so it's, 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 it's different. But at the end of the day, here's my thought when it comes to life insurance and planning in general. I'd rather you have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Mm -hmm. I've been in this business for 20 years. I've paid out dozens of claims, millions, tens of millions of dollars in benefits. And I'm yet ever to have a, a, a recipient of those funds tell me, you know what, Sophie, I, I think it's too much. I think it's too much. Never. No yeah. one has ever told me I think it's No too one much. ever says that. No one ever says, I wish yes. I had less life yes. insurance. On, on, on the contrary, on the contrary, it's always, I wish there was he more. He did more, yeah. 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 There's always, there's always, from my perspective, a need for more. Yeah. There's always a need. So going back to what you said about not testing or not taking into consideration COVID mm -hmm. results, Mm -hmm. So um, I want to clarify. So are you saying that at some point when uh, life insurance companies change their guidelines and underwriting policies, they may up the policies for individuals that are actually COVID positive? Yeah, yeah. I mean, think about it, right? Like any, this is, this is uncharted territory. No one could say, oh, this is what's going to happen because we've never gone through this before. You know, if you think about like a very deadly virus that came about in the 80s, right? HIV. If you think about it in theory, right? When HIV first hit, it wasn't a part of the underwriting process. They weren't testing for it because it wasn't, it was new, right? And it's the same thing with, with COVID, right? There are no, look, I've written billions of dollars of life insurance, thousands of policies on, on no application right now. Now, here's the crazy thing. I'm seeing rumblings and I'm hearing rumblings mm. of, of it changing. I've seen carriers saying, right, you know what, actually, we're not issuing any new policies right now while we recalibrate 
and figure this out. But what I am saying across the board right now, it's not, it's not a hard and fast rule in the industry. Will it be like that in six months? Uh, you know, I, I don't know, but I'll tell you what, today, today, today I could write a life insurance policy on somebody that literally mm -hmm. has COVID that has it right now. And the question not even be asked of them. Yeah. Why wait to do something in six months when you can get it done today? Right. Yeah, I mean, exactly. So when they're, when you're writing these policies, are they actually um, requiring examinations since everyone's kind of quarantined and are the medical examinations happening? Um, some, right. It's not, it's not steadfast. It's like, um, I, I'm, I'm a broker, so I represent many companies. And so this isn't across the board, but um, um, traditionally, you would go through an exam. So you'd have an examiner, you'd go to your house, your office, you go into it, they're taking blood, they're taking urine, right? They're running you through these batteries of tests. They're, they're, they're going to pull what's called your um, MIB, Medical Information Bureau. They're going to test. They're going to look at your physician's records. They're going to pull RX, right? Do you have prescriptions? Mm -hmm. They're going to look at your MVR, right? This exhaustive thing. Some carriers even pull your credit, right? They want to they look at all these things. I think what carriers have started to do, and this is even pre-COVID, what a lot of them are starting to do is going, you know what? We're spending all these monies, money on expensive tests and all the like. Why don't we just run them through their medical information bureau? And if nothing really comes up, if nothing coded is coded, you know, negatively, let's just issue the policy. No blood, no urine, right? So there are some carriers right now that I could literally apply for you online, and if if you come through clean through their variety of background, I can issue a policy in ten minutes, right? Is there any? Um, so when they issue the policy, are there any exceptions or exclusions in the fine print? that they put in knowing that they're doing it without an examination? Now, now, now what, I, what I will say is this, is that, um, yes, obviously I'm not suggesting that people commit fraud and, and not right. rely on the applications, but um, again, if they don't ask you, then there's nothing to divulge. I, I guess in theory, if they said, have you been to the hospital, right? Have mm -hmm. you been to the hospital or have you seen a, a doctor in the last, you know, you know, 60 days, 90 days, what have you, and you have, then you have to disclose that. But um, if, if maybe if you just, Got, here's the thing I tell people. When people go eat selfie, I have a, a, phys, a physical schedule for next month. Should I go get my physical and then apply for life insurance? I tell them, no, get your life insurance <laughs> and, then, and then go get a physical. Because if okay. something, if you go to that doctor and, they re, and it's revealed like, oh, you've got an illness or if you've got COVID or as a result, you've got uh, some fluid on your lungs and it's bad. Yes, now you have a whole different slew of issues. I always tell people, put these things in place before you see a foreseeable need mm -hmm. for them. Um, but again, uh, there are still carriers, again, that are going towards complete, you know, paperless, no exams going through there. So it's not, again, a hard and fast. There may be, there, there are certainly carriers today that, that do or have already started to integrate this COVID questioning into it. But mm -hmm. what I'm saying is, is it's not across the board. You can, gotcha. still, you can still get it. You can still get it done, which is very different from the traditional underwriting of 30 to 60 days of going through these exhaustive tests and them receiving records and, and them in some instances issuing policies literally in, you know, a week. Yeah. So this is actually really good for smokers or people who would have, or are they still disclosing? Again, and, and, and again, I, I digress. I, I didn't. So, so again, if I smoke cigarettes and I'm asked on the, on the, on the application, do you smoke cigarettes? And I say, nope. Right. Well, that is going to affect my rate, but here's the way it works. Okay. Here's the way it works. There's something called a contestability period as it relates to life insurance. Okay. If you are issued a life insurance policy, right. And you have lied on the application and you die inside of two years, the insurance company reserves the right to deny that claim. And they would simply return the premiums paid with interest. Right. If you live two years and a day and you lied and you lied or you withheld something and you died, they have to pay. That's the period. So that's why people think, oh, there are exclusions with suicide, not an exclusion, right? The catch is you got to wait two years and one day. So patience. If, if, but, well, if you're yeah. doing, yeah, we won't go. So we have a question on Instagram um, or we have a comment. So they do not underwrite COVID positive patients for 30 days until they get a clearance from their doctor. That so I think well, some companies, well, it sounds like. That may very well be for a particular company, but it is not right. across the board. But like I said, some, some companies are starting, 
you know, uh, I forget, but I know of a, at least a couple of carriers that actually went on a hiatus, like dark, like we're not issuing anything. So we recalibrate and others that are like, keep it coming. And, and so again, for me as a broker, I'm not bound to what any company says like, Oh goodness, this particular carrier isn't writing this. And, and that goes not only for COVID it's, it's for every, it's, it's for every underwriting challenge. Like if I know a client is obese, I'm going to go to one carrier over another. If I know a client had breast cancer history, I'm going to go to one carrier over another. If I know a client had a substance abuse issue, I'm going to go to one carrier over another because not all carriers underwrite all ailments the same, right? So I can mix and match and change based on someone's situation. Okay. So some of these questions might seem repetitive, but they're not. I promise you all. They were specific questions asked, and I want to make sure that we answer them for the people that asked. So um, I, I just want you to clarify. So if somebody applies, they get insured, right? And whether they had COVID or not, whether they disclosed, there was no disclosure question asked about COVID. And then later on, they get COVID and they pass away. Um, that policy will be paid, from my understanding? Yes. Yes. Yeah, the benefits, the proceeds paid under a life insurance policy are received income tax free by the beneficiary. Okay. Um, and we already talked about exclusions and, and restrictions and grace periods. You covered two years. You're like knocking out all of my questions <laughs> as usual before I even have a chance to speak. Um, so so like, like you mentioned, the two year contestability period, if the person passes away from a condition that they had, they didn't disclose, they contest it, not paid out. Mm -hmm. I think that's, uh, now, I think now, that's now, where um, I want to be clear. Mm -hmm. It's not that if you die in two years, they won't pay the benefit. They will. If meaning if I bought a policy on Monday, if I bought a policy on Monday and was driving home on Friday and got killed in a car accident, they will pay. If I, if I got a policy in January and six months later got diagnosed with terminal cancer, but I did not know I had it in January, they will pay. The mm -hmm. only difference between that six month mark and two years in a day is that that six month mark, they're gonna investigate it. They're gonna, they're gonna say, did this person know, right? Are we gonna go to the attending physician statements and find, oh, he saw a doctor in, you know, out of network and got this cancer diagnosis and that's why he got life insurance and now we found it, we didn't find it preliminarily. But assuming you didn't know, and again, I've, I've had those situations. I've, I've literally paid death claims inside of, of a year, right? Um, and both for illness and accidents. So if someone doesn't have any life insurance right now and they are eager to strike while the iron is hot, right? Yep. And it's the easiest time for someone to actually purchase life insurance right now. They don't have to jump through hoops. Where would you recommend that they start? A term policy, what type would you recommend just to get the ball rolling? So, so, so two things, first and foremost, we look at we look at need amount. And again, that's the fine, I call that again, human capital. So what's, what does your family need? Forget policy type for, for a moment. What does your family need? So take what your family needs on an annual basis. If you weren't here, multiply that by 20. That now is your face amount of coverage, our target face amount of coverage. The second question is premium paying ability. Ultimately, affordability dictates your purchase decision. So now I have to say, well, what is my budget for insurance? So let's talk about the different policy types. Term insurance is like renting the insurance pure protection so i can buy a policy and i can outline at the time of purchase how long i want that term to last the longer i lock in the term of time right the higher my premium will be so for example a 20-year term policy is more expensive than a five-year term policy that term is the length of time my premium is level so if i buy a 20-year term i'm 30 12 years old you do the math so 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 if I buy a 20 year term policy, right? That policy is gonna take me from 42 to 62. 42 to 62, right? Now, if life expectancy for a healthy male is 87 and my policy runs out at 62, then what? Oops, right? Now I could say, well, at least in the next 20 years, right? My girls will be out of, you know, knock on wood. My girls will be out of the house and they'll be out of college and they'll be, they should be fine, right? So, so that's why people, so term insurance is ideal for people who need coverage for a short or limited period of time or until they can afford to purchase permanent insurance. Two forms of permanent insurance would be whole life and universal life. Whole life is like a 30 year fixed mortgage. Your premium price is fixed at the time of purchase. So your age when you buy, your health when you buy, your premium is fixed, will never change. See that the tricky thing about term insurance is term insurance starts out really low, right? 
example, I can buy at 42 years old, I can buy a million dollars of term coverage for like 50 bucks a month. Super inexpensive, right? The problem is if I live to 62, that $50 a month premium, once I turn 63, is gonna become 500 a month, 1,000 a month, 5,000 a month, 10,000 a month, 20,000 a month. Literally the policy you used to pay $50 a month for will be $5,000 a month. Well, what will you do with it? You will dump it, you will cancel it because you're not gonna pay that. Now, if you said, but if I still want insurance, I'll just buy a new term policy at 62 and I'll pay $50 a month again. Ha <laughs> ha, no you won't because at 62, right? <laughs> A million dollars of coverage isn't fifty dollars a month anymore, right? It's four hundred dollars a month, right? And again, it will take you from sixty-two to eighty-two. Again, problem: life expectancy is eighty-seven. It still is not designed to be there through life expectancy. Ha ha! At eighty-two, I'll buy another one. No, you won't, because they don't issue term policies to eighty-year-olds. Because why? They'll most likely have to pay. Yeah. Because yeah. if you look at Limra study, shows that less than one percent. I don't know if you realize, like less than one percent of term policies pay the benefit so a whole life policy offsets that because the policy is there for how long my whole life as the name suggests never is going to expire never is going to expire so premium price fix at the time of purchase policy is there for life you say that sounds great you still think why wouldn't everyone do that cost you know i said that million dollar term policy is 50 bucks a month right million dollar whole life policy at my age would cost me more like 1500 dollars a month whoa that's a big difference right now difference as i'm paying that premium that policy is building a cash value it's building equity and i can actually use that equity in life imagine if you got all your car insurance premiums back if you didn't get into a car accident imagine if you got all your health insurance premiums back if you didn't go visit the doctor that's how permanent policies work that's how cash value building policies work so as i'm paying that premium that policy is building equity that i can draw from tax free Based on me being 42, if I were to take this money out as a retirement supplement, I'll be able to draw out about $3 tax-free for every dollar I put in. So if I was putting in $1,500 a month, not only would I have a million dollars plus of life insurance for my beneficiaries for life, I'm going to be able to pull out $4,500 a month income tax-free for me. $4,500 a month tax-free is like making $6,000, $7,000 a month taxable, right? So it, that's a benefit. There's a living benefit associated with uh, permanent life insurance, whole life. Universal life, quite simply, is another form of permanent insurance, except for it allows for flexibility in premium payments. Whole life is a set it and forget it plan. You buy a whole life policy, whether you look at that plan every six months or you look at it every 10 years, it's gonna do what it's gonna do, no surprises. Universal life works differently because like a whole life issues interest based on the uh, issuance of a dividend, right? Mm -hmm. Universal life credits interest one of three ways. One is fixed interest. So I'll give you an example. I'm paying the same $1,500 a month into a universal life policy. And let's assume that the cost of insurance was $300 a month. So, so $300 comes out, right? $300 comes out of the $1,500. And the $1,200 that's left is going to earn a fixed rate of return, say 4%. Mm -hmm. That's a fixed universal life. You've got an index universal life. An index universal life. I pay the same $1,500. The same $300 comes out for cost of insurance. There's $1,200 left. That $1,200 is now going to earn a rate of return commensurate with the performance of an indices. Let's say like the S&P 500. What makes index policies really attractive is that index policies allow me to enjoy the upside of an index and none of the market's downside. See, when you invest your money, there's typically one of three outcomes you're going to experience. You're going to make money, stay flat, or lose money. An index policy eliminates the loss. So if the market goes up 20%, I can get a 20% return. If the market goes down 20%, I'll get a zero, right? So I'll still have cost of insurance come out of my policy, but I don't suffer any market losses. Lastly, you have variable universal life. Variable universal life literally allows me to buy mutual funds, separate accounts inside of my policy, right? So the same thing, I pay the same $1,500, the same $300 comes out for cost of insurance. That $1,200 now is buying mutual funds. And in that respect, I have what's called naked risk. I get all the upside of what those mutual funds do, and I assume all the downside, right? So when people go, wow, that's a lot to digest. How do I decide? First and foremost, 
What does your family need? Human capital. Second, what is your budget, right? And then depending on those two variables, now the last question, well, is it whole life or is it an index? Is it a universal life policy? Last question, do you want a predictable outcome or a probable one? Whole life provides predictability, right? If I pay this level of premium, I have this guaranteed cash value and I have this guaranteed death benefit, right? In a universal life policy, right, there's, there's some variation, right? Could it outperform? Sure, right? Like it, it could outperform, right? But, but the question begs, do you want a predictable outcome or a probable one? So remember when I told you I'll get about $3 mm -hmm. back tax-free if I buy in retirement if I bought a whole life? In an index policy, it could be five, six dollars tax free based on historical performance, right? So it could be double the, the benefit out. The question begs, do you want a guarantee? Do you want a guarantee? Or, or are you saying, you know what, I'm, I'm willing to swing for the fences? It's not my job to tell people it's whole life or term. And that's the problem I think that most people get when you deal with financial services professionals and, and wirehouse guys. They tend to be zealots about what they sell, right? A wirehouse guy is gonna, ah, forget life insurance, buy term, invest the difference, let me have it in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, right? An insurance guy is gonna tell you, I'm a, I'm a mutual company guy all whole life, all day long, right? Everything else is garbage, right? Uh, an independent broker is typically gonna tell you, oh, it's all about index and universal life. That's, that's, and for me, it's not about whole life, it's not about index, it's not about term, it's one, does your family have enough coverage? Two, what can you set aside? What can you pay? And then three, what policy or combinations of policy suit you best? Because the last thing is, it's not an all or nothing. Because if you said, hey, Sophia, all right, what do you have? I have all of them. Mm -hmm. I have some term, right? Why? I have term policy right now. I have a key man policy on myself, right? So, so if I die, does my company need to shut down, right? No. Now, would there be a disruption to my practice if something happened to me? Without a doubt right? But I've got a $5 million policy. I'll say that a little quiet because my staff might hear me. I got a $5 million policy. If something happens to me, right, that, that the bills can get paid. Mortgage here gets paid. Payroll gets paid. I can find a predecessor to come in and, and manage the book of business and keep things uh, afloat while, while the business is recalibrating, right? My permanent life insurance policies, that's my accumulation. Again, I mentioned my building. This building that I'm sitting in right now, right, I bought it in part with a distribution from my life insurance policies. I took cash value out of my policies at 38 years old to buy this building. Why? Because I was paying $10,000 a month in rent at the corporate center. And mm -hmm. I said, hell, if I'm gonna pay $10,000 a month, I should pay it to myself, right? So I used the cash value from my policy at 38 years old, not 78, not 88, 38 years old to buy this asset now that's worth millions of dollars, right? So how will you need the money? When will you need the money? I don't know but it's, it's, it's there, right? So to each his own, right? So whether it's to protect your family, for your business and the like. So I don't subscribe to, and this is my problem with most people when they, when they give mm -hmm. recommendations of finance, they're like, this is what everyone should do. You know what everyone should do? Nothing. No, not everyone. No, get that out of here. People should do what's right for them. People should do what's right for their family. My job isn't even to tell people what to do. My job is to educate people. My I job love that. I love that. This is how this works, right? What the, the explanation I just gave of life insurance, of, of the 99% of people that actually even have it, I guarantee you they've never heard know. of an explanation like that before. No. Right? So I, I didn't say that one was necessarily better than the other. It's just, it's just, it's just, this is how this works. And when you know how this works, right, then, then you, you can't win a game if you don't know the rules, right? Right? Do you know how to play rugby? Do you know how to play rugby? No. Mm -hmm. So if you went on, a, on to play in a rugby match right now, you probably wouldn't fare too well because you don't know the rules of the game. So one thing, and I saw a question pop up, you know, when should you get it? Now, now, mm -hmm. now, now, right? Because two things, you're probably not getting healthier, right? Now, now, now I, I am actually Benjamin Button. I am reverse. You're aging. reverse aging. Right now I am reverse <laughs> aging. I might be in the best shape of my life right now, 42 years old, but I am certainly not getting younger right? I'm certainly not getting younger. So the yeah. cost of doing it goes up with time. Um, I have three daughters again. I bought my daughters all whole life policies, permanent policies, literally the month they were born. 
because I locked in the cost of insurance for them at a zero. And now they're not going to get 20, 30 years of compounding interest. They're going to get 60, 70 years of compounding interest, right? It's phenomenal, especially, and this isn't like, this isn't something that, that, you know, people of color or, you know, white, black, you know, Asian, this is for everybody, but historically people of color haven't done these things and haven't, you know, um, planned and done the state planning and, and legacy. Cause here's the thing it's you bought life insurance on your hours. Oh no. Guess what? Whether I bought the policy or not, they're going to die too someday. Right. But, but, and hopefully, hopefully many, 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 many years from now, but tell you what, what I've done is I've now set up a legacy for their children and their children's children. Right. And so that's, that's why. So buying it young, let buying the money, buying these policies young, locking in the premium, letting that cash value grow is it. And I'm trying to explain this to my daughters, right? I want them to understand. I'm like, you have these policies. I show them the annual statements. I don't know if that's a good idea because they're like, dad, I got money like that. When can I get the money? When can I, when I'm like, what do you need the money for? They're like, I want to buy stuff. I'm like, nah, you're not buying stuff. Right. You know, my, yeah. my, my, so that my answers, that actually answers one of the questions we got asked. Well, you got asked how important is it for younger people to get it? So I guess that answers the question of yeah. the younger you get it, the better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, it, it's, it's, uh, there, I see another question. How does life insurance uh, help, help business owners? And I gave Yeah, that I have, I have a whole answer. series of questions on that, but yes. we'll get into that. But I want to go back to the, to yes. the cash value. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm asking questions and I'm putting myself in a situation of a person, a lay person who would not otherwise, you know, I, I see it every day in my profession. So I want to ask the way it would be asked by someone. Um, what happens to this cash value? Let's say somebody doesn't dip into it and use it to buy a property. Let's say somebody, they just let it live, let it stay. What happens when they're gone? So generally speaking, in a whole life policy, as your policy is building cash value, um, and, and if it's eligible for dividends, there's your, those dividends that are issued on an annual basis are buying what's called paid up additions, paid up additional insurance. What does that mean in English? I buy a million dollar policy today. So my death benefit today is a million dollars. My cash value is zero today. Well, as my cash value grows from 20,000 to 50,000 and a hundred thousand, as that policy is growing and, and the dividends are being issued, my death benefit is growing from a million to a million 20 to a million 50 to 1.1 to 1.2 and so forth. So if I die, never have having access any of that cash in the policy, that death benefit is also larger for my, for my beneficiary. So there's something called endowment at age 121, your cash value and death benefit will be one in the same. So if I never touched that cash value, if I said, what if I never use it, Sophie, by the time my cash value gets to five, $6 million, that $1 million death benefit has also grown to five, $6 million and they're one and the same. So they're gonna get the, that benefit. The one difference would be in a universal life chassis. In a universal life policy, you can choose to have what's called an increasing death benefit or a level death benefit. And let me explain the two. In an increasing death benefit, your death benefit is gonna grow dollar for dollar on top of the cash value. So for example, at the time I get $200,000 of cash value, my death benefits grown from 1 million to 1.2 million. Again, I pass away without accessing that cash. My beneficiaries get the $1.2 million, right? In a level death benefit, same thing. I start with zero cash value, million dollar death benefit. I have $200,000 of cash value. You know what my, my heirs get? A million bucks. Now you go, why would anyone choose that? Now here's the catch. In a level death benefit, what's actually happening is the cost of insurance is the cost of insurance in general is going up in a universal life policy every year that you get older. But in a level death benefit, that increase in cost of insurance is being offset by the accumulation in the policy. What does that mean again in English, Sophie? Please break that down. I start with zero cash value today. I have a million dollars of death benefit. When my cash value is 200,000, if my death benefit's still only a million, what is the net amount at risk to the insurance company? Mm -hmm. It's no longer a million dollars. What is it? It's $800,000. So now they're only charging you cost of insurance on that $800,000 difference, not the entire million because your cash value has now diminished their amount at risk. Now, if you said, if that's the case, Sophie, wouldn't the cost of insurance be significantly lower? Yes and no. Even though the amount at risk has now gone from a million to 800,000, mm -hmm you're now 15 years older. So the cost of insurance is also higher as well. So um, generally speaking, I see that 
increasing death benefits give more value to a client than a level death benefit. I oftentimes am selling level death benefits when I'm doing estate planning for, for retirees. So in that 70, 75 year old plus market, that, that increase in cash value does tend to offset that cost of insurance in a much more powerful manner than the younger client, which makes sense, right? Because when you're younger, the cost of insurance is low. If you can build a lot of cash value in that policy, you're fine. When I'm older, I don't have a lot of time to build a lot of cash value. So I find the level death benefits typically perform a little bit better um, for, for older for So older on, on that same note, going off of that, what you just said. So um, if the policy has cash value and at some point in life, they want to stop making the premiums, um, because that's their plan. They're going to stop working. They're not going to be able to afford the premiums anymore. Can the cash value actually feed itself? And I think that's what you were getting at. Yeah. So, so um, some policies are actually designed to be guaranteed to pay off at a particular time. That's typically how I do them. I don't, I don't oftentimes sell what I call all pays, meaning your premiums do forever. I like to structure um, policy premium paying periods that coincide with someone's working years. So for example, if I planned on working until age 65, I'm typically going to pay that policy up before age 65. So that when you're retired, you're not saddled with this big premium payment that the policy's paid on, right? Um, so that's what's called premium offsets. I can use the policy's internal values and growth and dividends to offset the, the out-of-pocket cost of premiums. So uh, with, with COVID ha happening, there's a lot of laws out there where people can dip into their retirement and not pay penalties and whatnot. Is there something out there that they've kind of implemented for life insurance where you can dip into your cash value, loan out, but not pay interest on the money? Or <laughs> I had to ask. The insurance companies aren't that nice. I have seen some carriers. I have some. Maybe wave premiums. Pre but, but, but see, there's really no waiving. It's putting, it, it might, they might let you defer them because here's the, here's the problem right? They're going to pay the benefit when you die. So they want their money, right? They want their money. It's a little different. People go, oh, well, my auto, my auto premiums are reduced or my auto is giving me a rebate. Well, that's because you're not driving. In this instance, the likelihood, the mortality rates are actually higher. So they're not going to yeah. give you a break on your premiums. I'm sorry. Yeah. You got to, you got to, you got to find the, the, the break somewhere else. Awesome. Um, not awesome, but yeah, I, I want to go like this right now, everyone, because I like I asked three questions, but as Elfie answered the, the 20 that I had on my list with just those three questions. Um, but let's talk about business owners and life insurance. OK, I have a lot of entrepreneur clients, a lot of business owner clients, and not many of them are aware of the intricacies involved and what happens at death, like you just explained with your own life examples. So. Yeah. How can business owners use life insurance to their advantage? Yeah, so um, first thing that you have to look at, there's, there's two types of life insurance that a business owner, or I'll give you three things that business owners should consider. Number one, you have to consider what, I, what and look at your buy-sell agreement. Now, oftentimes people go, well, what's that buy-sell agreement? Or I have an operating agreement with my entity, is, is, does that suffice? The mm -hmm. buy-sell agreement addresses what I call the three Ds, death, disability and divorce in the event that one partner or multiple partners are are, are 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 removed from the company what happens so for illustration's sake let's say that you and I were business partners right and mm -hmm. our business is worth two million dollars right and we're 50 50 we are equal partners so one million dollars of that business values is yours one million is mine right so and we're best of friends. We trust each other implicitly, right? Been working together for years. And I die. I die. I'm gone, right? You now owe my estate a million dollars for my share of the business. Where's the money coming from? Right? That's a good question. Hopefully there's life now, insurance. Right. So, so that's, where, that's where life insurance comes into play. Now, now you might, and because here's the thing. There's three things at work in life, people at work, money at work, and other people's money at work. And I love OPM. I love using other people's money. Even if you said, e Sophie, I got a million dollars sitting in a safe deposit box in case that ever happens. I'm good. Why would you use your own money when you could use the insurance company's money? Exactly. Right? OPM, right? So now there's a life insurance policy that comes into play, right? And you go, okay, there's a million dollars that goes income tax-free to our entity. There's two types of buy-sell agreements you can have. You can have what's called an entity plan, 
and an entity plan, the corporation. So let's call our corporation XYZ Corp. XYZ Corp owns the policy on you, a million dollar policy on you. XYZ Corp, Corp owns the million dollar policy on me. When either one of us die, those proceeds go to the corporation. That allows us to buy out our respective shares. I'm so sorry for your loss, Mrs. Taylor. Here's your million dollars. You're out of here. Otherwise, you have a new business partner. Mm -hmm. My estate is now your business partner. And guess what? You might not like my ex-wife, right? She might come in and say, I don't like the way you're doing things. And I own 50% of the company. So you're going to change them. Or better yet, right? I don't have any problem with the way that you do things. I want my check though. I'll sit back while you do all the work and I get half the profit. I love it. So going back, going back, I think this is, this is a key point that business owners don't realize. The corporation pays the premiums and is the owner of the policies. Are these corporate premiums deductible off of their return? So, so generally speaking, life insurance um, premiums are not tax deductible. Um, there are some caveats. There are some pension structures where you can buy life insurance and pension plans and deduct the premiums. Generally speaking, though, I would say no, you're, you're not to deduct. Now, do people do it? Eh, it's, like, it's like driving 80 miles an hour on the freeway. Do, do people do it every day? Yeah. Are you supposed to? No, right? No. Because the proceeds are received income tax free. That is an entity plan where the corporation buys. The other type of way that you can fund the buy-sell agreement is what's called a cross-purchase, where, where I own a policy on your life and you own a policy on my life. And if you go, oh, that doesn't seem that complex, it's really just the purchase of two policies, so it's not more complex than an entity plan. Here's where it gets dicey. A, a cross-purchase plan gets dicey when you have five partners, because now I have to buy a policy on one, two, three, four other people. And they might need to buy a policy on one, two, three, four other people. And, and, it, gets, and it gets really, really it's messy. So rather, than, so rather than, yeah, exactly. It's 20 yeah. policies as opposed to five, right? And so, so that's where generally speaking, especially when you have multiple partners, an entity plan comes into play. And it doesn't have to be 50-50. We can have an 80-28 ownership interest, right? Where you own 80%, I own 20. And now you have 800,000 of insurance. I have 200,000, right? It, it doesn't really matter. So you've got that. That's one. I sell agreement. Life insurance is important. And I also mentioned the other D. Disability. disability mm -hmm. Which could be worse. Oh, by the way, I'm not dead. I'm just dis disabled. So now you're running operations. I was doing sales. I'm not here for sales. You still owe me half the company. And I can't do any of the work. And I want my check. Mm -hmm. Right? So disability, you can have disability income. And what I also have, I, I'm... I am, I am in my top 10 biggest clients, me, right? I have it all, right? Because I'm like, I got to practice what I preach. You have the disability income replacement, and you also have what's called DOE, business overhead. So I've got a policy that will replace my income, and I have a policy that's going to pay the bills. It's going to pay the mortgage on the building, and it's going to cover payroll. Ah, DOE. So that's the disability component, right? So I want to cover death. I want to cover disability, right? And divorce, don't have insurance for that. Get a good counselor and a, a good mediator. Good luck with that one. We can't happen. help you with the divorce yeah. aspect of it. Yeah. But, but, um, but, so you, somebody, but, you, but you can still, at least in that, in that document, in that buy sell agreement, right. waive the right. The mm -hmm. Right. So I would, I would definitely recommend having your spouse waive their rights yeah. to the interest um, in case of divorce. So along those lines, somebody asked, can I buy life insurance on someone else's life? And your example with the business partners, pretty much... You, you, can buy us that it's possible. you can buy life insurance on someone else's life, yes, as long as there's what's called an insurable interest, right? Insurable interest, meaning if you and I are business partners, I have an insurable interest. Even though we are not related, our insurable interest is we're partners, and if, and if something happens to you, there's a financial hardship that I'm going to encounter, I have an insurable interest. Now, can I drive down the street and go, oh, that guy looks sick. Hey, come here. I want to buy life insurance for us. I don't think you're going to make it. No, there's no insurable, there's no insurable interest. Um, um, so, so that's one. You also have what's called key man. And here's another example of an insurable interest, right? Let's say that you and I are the two operators and we've got Mary. And Mary is a firecracker. I mean, she kills the game for us. She sells like no other. And if something happened to Mary, we would be up, up the creek, right? So we might go, Mary, we, Mary brings us a million dollars in sales. Now, is Mary the only person in the world who can do what she does? Or are you the only person who can do operations? Or am I the only person who can do outside sales? No. 
But key man says, let's go one step further. If this person were to die, how would it also interrupt the company? So for the buy sell, especially with partners, I need to not only consider your value to the company, but I need to also consider your replacement cost. So I need to not only cover the million dollars for our each respective share of the business, I might need to add another 500,000 on there because I need money to stabilize, to stabilize operations while I go find another uh, COO. Another Mary. Right? right? Exactly. Yeah. So that's key, man. And then lastly, if you're using permanent life insurance to solve any of these buy, sell, or key man, that cash value accumulation can be used as a deferred comp. It sits nice. on the it sits on the, the books of the balance sheet of the of the company. Very nice. I love it. We covered most of the questions that we had for um, business owners and life insurance. I wanted to ask. Um, I want to go back really quickly. If if someone is really struggling with obviously not having income, what do you recommend they do with life insurance premiums that are owing? I mean, how do you, how do you recommend they manage that? Cause we don't want it, them to let go of the policies. It all comes down to a choice. And so if you haven't done so already, there are several financial provisions that you can take right now. If you haven't done so already, if you own a home, call your bank, they're allowing forbearance programs. So they're allowing you to push your payments. My bank actually offered up to six months of not paying your mortgage. So generally speaking, the largest payment that most of us have is our mortgage or rent payment. So imagine not having your mortgage payment for three months, six months. Mm -hmm. That's going to help. Um, everything you could think of. My car payments, I got reductions in my car payments, um, my cell phone, credit card interest rate reductions, um, even my kid's school. Everything I could think of to cut expense, I did. Right? Utilities, everything I could think of, I did. At the end of the day, it comes down to choice. Right? I'm struggling, you selfie. Imagine someone calling, calling me, Sophie, I'm struggling. I can't make my life insurance policy, pre my premium payments, and cancel my policy. That's interesting. Your cell phone seems to be on, though, right? <laughs> it's a matter of choice. You can't have direct TV. You can't have direct TV and then tell me you can't have life insurance. It doesn't work for me. It's, 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 a, it's a choice, right? And so I'd say to the extent possible, do that. Now, some on a lower level, people got, people got, uh, you know, the stimulus checks. I know that's not a lot of money. If you're a business owner, and I'm now starting to see some of these from the, um, from the PPP, program that I've applied yeah, yeah. for, the PPP loan, the Payroll Protection Act, that's coming in with money to pay, two and a half months worth of payroll, the, um, the COVID disaster loans, those are coming through. I've gotten a series of clients call me in this last week telling me, hey, you still got, they're offering me $150,000 at 3.75%. Should I take it? Yes, right? Like it's inexpensive money. If that helps you keep, Payroll covered, business covered. Even maybe you, maybe maybe we come out of this period better than we were mm -hmm. before. Maybe you said I've always wanted to hire a new person. I didn't have the liquidity, or we needed to upgrade our systems. And there you go, right? Grow. That's why the money's there to help you, not to hoard, not to put in your checking account, but to implement, put back to your business. Is there? Yeah. I got, I got, I got fifty seconds on my Instagram, and so it kicks me off. It's, it's uh, okay. We'll, we'll finish it out on live on Facebook. Okay. Um, I really want to ask this one question uh, with, with respect to the retirement withdrawals without the penalty. Are you seeing that happening with your clients? Are they dipping into their uh, retirement plan? There, there, was, there was formally a 60-day rule. So you could access retirement monies without an IRS penalty or taxes. If you put the money back in 60 days, you were good. Based on this um, CARE Act, that 60 day rule has now been eliminated. It's now a three year rule. You can access that money up to three years. You have to put it back. The 10% RS penalty is off the table. And if you don't put it back within three years, you actually have three years to extend the okay. tax liability. So it's extended a, a fair amount. Awesome. Yeah. We got disconnected off of your off Instagram. That. I'm just gonna, um, um, are you going back on? I will go back on. I am going to. Uh, I'm going to post this. Zelfi, you're on fire. I have questions uh, and no opportunity to ask them, and you're just uh, blowing through them in consecutive order, um, and it's just amazing. I love it. We had a lot of other questions and I wrote them down, but um, 
I love, I love, love, love the idea of, of putting everything together now. And I think now is just such a good time for people. Like if they've ever considered life insurance and they have nothing, I just don't understand why people aren't jumping at the chance. Yeah. This is it, like, it's, it's, people, it's like people, low dangling fruit. This is it. Yep. People know, people know they should be doing it, but, but they, but they, but they wait, you know, they wait. You know, yeah, you know, it's off. the same. It's the same with estate planning. It's something that people always want to do. It's always in the back of their mind. Um, they always want to. It's like, oh yeah, I've been thinking about it. I've been thinking about it. But COVID is really making it real, right? Because we always talk about what if, what if, what if, what if. Yeah. Well, now the what ifs are happening. All the all yeah. the things, the unexpected things that you didn't think were going to happen have happened. Yeah. And now they've become reality. So I'm going to ask I'm, I'm, Joy. I'm back up on. Uh, I'm back up on live now. If you. Uh... Yeah. There you are. Yeah, no, I, I mean, obviously, I, it's it's crazy because a lot of people, when uh, a lot of people um, don't, when they then they don't know me really well. I, I'm pretty mellow, right? I had a, I, you know, I'm improvisers, the networking group, and and I had a, I had a a, a troika meeting with two other two other professionals, and he goes, man. I've never heard you say more than 10 words before, right? Because in general, I'm pretty like, yeah, I'm pretty, you know, I'm pretty subdued, especially in large group, whatever. I'm just like, let people do their thing. But this is, this area, obviously, as you can tell, is something that I'm very passionate, You're passionate about, about, yeah. you know, and, 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 and I, and I, and I believe it, you know, and because it's not like, again, it's not, it's not like if, or like, oh, maybe this will work. Like, no, mm -hmm. this is 100% going to be utilized, like 100%. So we gotta, we gotta be proactive and, and do the you know do the right thing and plan yeah, you know death plan is inevitable. yeah 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 uh fa father father time is undefeated, undefeated. I, I wanted to ask you some more questions on retirement but i'm not yep. sure if i should leave it off i don't want to make this too long but um are you hearing an echo uh, let me try maybe blow away the volume yeah uh, okay so for individuals that have to take their rmd yet they don't need it yep. and they're just paying extra taxes. Yep. Is there, what type of recommendations do you have for them for actually using that money, taking the RMDs because they're required to take it, yep. flipping it around, paying premiums on life insurance, yep. and then taking the cash value of that policy to pay the taxes and saving yep. the difference? I'm all, I'm all about creative strategies. Um, Number one, based on this CARE Act, the RMD is eliminated for 2020 or 2020, right? So no RMD this year. Um, I find that a lot. So a couple options that people have that are faced with taking RMDs and they really don't need the money, but they're forced. Wait, can we explain to people what and, an RMD yeah, so is? I was gonna say, RMDs, yeah, RMDs are required minimum distributions. So at age 70 and a half, basically now it's being 71 now with the, with the new, uh, um, um, secure act that was just passed but if you have not yet started to draw from your retirement savings the irs feels like they've allowed you to, to defer tax long enough and they want you to start drawing your money um, it's based on an amortization table of life expectancy if you uh, wanted to figure it out it's usually like somewhere around three and a half to four percent of your value in your account is what you're forced to draw needing the money or not so i'm going to give you an example i've got i've got a hundred thousand dollars in my uh, I'll say I'll rather this one. I got a million dollars in my in my in my IRA, and I don't need the money, but I'm at RMD age. I have to take the money out, so I'm gonna have to take out roughly call it forty thousand dollars. Now I have to pay the taxes on that forty thousand dollars, right? So a couple of options that I've employed with clients to offset that. One option is what's called a QUILAC. QUILAC stands for Qualified Longevity Annuity Contract. QUILAC. Um, you can move up to one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars of your of your retirement money into this basically deferred 10 year um, income annuity. And that's going to minimize the amount of RMDs that you have to take. Now, again, that, 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 that solves the problem a little bit, right? Because it, it's not, you know, again, if I have a million dollars and I could put 125 grand, it's, 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 it solves some of the problem, but that's one option. Another option, like you had mentioned is to take that, that RMD, Right, and this is a strategy that I've had. Because I tell people this, you know what, Sophie, this million bucks, I don't even need it. I'm gonna leave it to my family. I'm gonna leave my family a million bucks. And I said, no, you're not. And they go, 
what do you mean? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave a million dollars to my family. And I go, no, you're going to leave $500,000 to your family because that money's never been taxed. So when they go out and take that million dollar distribution, half of that's going to uncle Sam. So let's do this. Why don't you take your RMD, you take that 40,000, say you have to pay 10,000 in tax. You got $30,000 left. What if I use that $30,000 to buy a $1 million life insurance call? And now when you pass away, yes, there's still tax on that $1 million IRA, but it's replaced with a million dollars income tax free to your beneficiaries. That would be for somebody who wants to maximize the legacy for their heirs. Another option could be to simply give that money to charity, right? Because mm -hmm. if, if I take that $40,000 and I don't need the money and I'm giving gifts to church or charity, alma mater, what have you, if I give that $40,000 to charity, that $40,000 tax liability is offset by the $40,000 deduction. I pay no tax. Again, there's creativity. Um, oil and gas. I don't know if people realize this. Oil and gas partnerships, if you put qualified pre-tax money in an oil and gas partnership, because oil and gas are what's called a, a diminishing investment, right? As the oil comes mm -hmm. out of the well, the value drops. You, you can get up to an 80% discount on your IRA value when you invest in oil and gas. Example, if I put in a million dollars and the value of my IRA for tax purposes is 200,000, maybe I do a Roth conversion in that year. Mm -hmm. So now I pay taxes on the 200,000 and now all of the income that that million dollar investment generated all now come to me into a Roth income tax free. Guess what about, guess what? No more RMDs. So there's no shortage of creative strategies and tools out there to offset tax liability. We have to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. We all have to pay tax, but to the extent that there are programs and strategies allowable by law to mitigate that liability, let's, and again, let's be in the know, right? I'd rather have someone say, yes, I'm aware of these options and I choose to do nothing than sit idly by and pay more tax or lose money to, 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 to you know, that could otherwise be going to their family just because they were never given an alternative option. Yeah, I, I, I tend to see that a lot where, where I'll have uh, professional clients who've earned, who've just contributed to their retirement funds throughout the, the years. And they have one, they have two, they have three million in retirement just sitting there. And they have no other wealth other than their home that they own. And it's, I don't think they realize what's going to happen once they take those RMD credits. And I don't think anyone educates them on what's going to happen once their family inherits it. Um, so I think it's really important if you do have retirement accounts that you reach out to your financial advisor. If you don't have one or you don't like the one you have, reach out to people like Zelfi that are out there to educate. And I think the key is to have someone that is an educator, not a doer, that's going to tell you what to do. And you know me, like that's how I run my practice. I never tell a client, hey, you should do an AB split trust. I'm not them. I don't know how their marriage works, but I can give them the pros and cons and tell them this and this and this are the three appropriate right. trust vehicles. Right. Which one do you want to be driving, right? So I think the key takeaway from all this is get educated on the different policies that you have or that you want to get. Most importantly, if you have retirement accounts, I think it's so important to find out how you're invested, number one. Most, people, most of my clients don't know what, what their retirement account is. Or there's, there's so many, there's so many, there's so many, there's so many issues as it relates to retirement accounts. And when you look at it, we're in the midst of the greatest wealth transfer our country's ever seen. There's an estimated $41 trillion of wealth that's going to transfer from this generation to the next. And when you look at it without proper planning, a good chunk of that's going to go to taxes needlessly, right? Or get caught up in probate and all these things needlessly. Um, when you look at it, if I'm retiring, here's what I want to know. I ask people two questions. How much of your money do you not want to lose, right? Right. And you go, that's a silly question, you Sophie. Right. Well, it's a silly question. Right. And that generally speaking, most people, over half the people that are going into retirement say, I don't want to lose any money. Yet, when you look to your point at what they're actually doing, they're in ultra risky things or things that are subject to loss. So let's look at that. Second thing is longevity. Is your money going to last? And that's the thing that, that people don't realize. If I have a 60 40 blend of stocks to fixed income, 60 40 blend of stocks to fixed income. Did you know that if, if, there, if you experience a 20% market loss in the first year of retirement, that there is a 69% chance you're going to run out of money before you die? Mm -hmm. What? And that's crazy. And so we want to be proactive, not reactive. I always tell people, put these plans in place, make these changes when you can, 
not when you have to, because we can offset losses of principal. We can offset the, the risk of running out of money. We can eliminate the probate. We can eliminate, you know, um, um, frivolous spending by heirs, but we have to plan. These things don't just happen because mm -hmm. you're a good person. These things don't have to just happen because your kids are really smart. You, I had a client, that was the funniest estate planning uh, uh, excuse I ever heard a guy. I was like, these are all the things that happen. He goes, my son is really smart. And I was like, <laughs> so what? He'll handle he's it. Gonna be, he's going to be really smart in probate court. He's going to be really smart, right? He's going to be really smart writing the check to Uncle Sam, right? Yeah. You have to do these things. Yeah, I think, I think you know, you don't know what you don't know. And once you say that in your mind and you realize it's the truth, that should propel you to reach out to professionals in your life in these different areas to get your shit in order. Excuse my language. Because yeah. that's the worst thing you could do for your kids or your loved ones is to leave them in shambles and to have them see a $2 million policy or a $2 million retirement account and then wonder why half of it has to go to Uncle Sam. Yeah, yeah you, you That's you, your hard-earned assets that you earned throughout you, those, you know, blood, sweat, and tears working in that company. You, so you, you thought you thought you were leaving them a 401k and they're going to get a 201k. You're going to get half of that, right? Unless, unless you plan it. I like it. So that's it for my questions. I thank you so much for joining me today. I think you um, you gave out a lot of good information. I hope you guys out there, this will encourage you to at the very least open up those policies, open up that retirement portfolio, at least like get the conversation started. That's the whole purpose of this insight is to get you guys talking, get you guys reaching out to your professionals, find a good professional that you like working with that provides you with the answers. Don't feel ashamed to ask the questions. I think a lot of people are just nervous. There's, when, yeah, there's no, there's no silly questions. There's no bad questions. These professionals are being paid, right? They're being paid to serve you. And I tell my clients, I'm going to answer every question that you have. And if you call me in six months and ask me the exact same questions again, I'll answer them again. Totally fine. Right? Totally and, fine. And, so, and so, and I would rather, I'd rather, cause that's the thing. Like this isn't, this isn't like something you do. It's not like a, a moment in time. This is a relationship that goes on potentially for years, decades, right? And so relationship and open communication is, is so important. And it's also important that you share your objectives because you might draw the line in the sand today and go, these are the things that are important to me today. These are, these are the things I want to accomplish today. And in one year, five years, 10 years, it might be completely different and that's okay. But you need the open lines of communication to be able to, to, to impart that to the advisors and to the teams that you work with so they can you know, adjust and iterate your plans accordingly. I love it. So I'm going to link your information um, on the different social media platforms so that if, if, if individuals want to reach out to you and they have additional follow-up questions, they can actually find your information. Um, thank you for taking the time on this Friday afternoon. I hope you enjoyed the rest of your weekend yeah. and stay healthy, everyone. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you guys for being here today. Have a good one, guys.